This is Dane Holstrom, Divorce Authority. We're going to be talking about a lot of different subjects in family law. There are some important items that I'm required to share with you so that you understand the limited purpose of my going over all of this information with you. No matter what the specific topic, it's very important for you to understand that this information is not intended as legal advice for any specific person or any specific type or actual case. My sharing this information with you is not designed to create an attorney-client relationship. Everybody's case is different and nobody's results are the same. Just because we may discuss what happened in some other client's case that may in fact sound similar to yours or some other situation does not suggest that your case or the results would be the same or even similar. The discussion of specific cases are fictionalized and may not be real clients or cases. The purpose of these podcasts is to help you understand the framework of how these issues are decided, provide you a better understanding of the process, and hopefully give you insight as to how you might prepare and conduct yourself and your case to get a better result. There is absolutely no substitute for a consultation or hiring a competent, trained family law attorney, and I encourage you to seek out such an attorney as soon as practical in your case. Divorce Authority is a brand and registered trademark of Holstrom Block and Park, a professional law corporation. I've been practicing family law for 30 years. I've been certified by the state of California as a family law specialist, so I know a thing or two about divorce. I'm Dane Holstrom, and I am the Divorce Authority. Today, we're going to talk about the division of assets. Well, that includes also obligations, debts, loans, things like that. And it covers a spectrum of items from furniture, furnishings, jewelry, personal items, all the way up to cars and houses and timeshares and vacation homes and stocks and stock options and businesses and tax benefits and airline sky miles. All of those are part of the division of assets and obligations and credit card debt and mortgages and all of those as well. So before you can divide anything, you, you first you have to what's called characterize it. Characterizing an asset or obligation in a divorce situation means simply this. Is it community property? Is it separate property? Or is it a little bit of both? Refer to that latter description as something of a hybrid between community and separate property. Well, then we gotta know what is community property. Community property is anything that is acquired during marriage, and we're going to define that in a second, except if you acquired it during marriage by way of an inheritance or by gift. And even those are misleading. Well, we'll talk about that. So what is during the marriage? Obviously, the beginning date of a marriage is usually pretty clear, although there's lots of arguments on that sometimes. Well, We got our marriage license in Las Vegas on Tuesday, but we didn't really actually go through the ceremony until Friday. Well, why is that important? Because on Wednesday, I bought a winning lottery ticket. You get the idea. If an asset is acquired before the marriage, then it is not community property. It is separate property. At the other end of the end of the marriage, if an asset is acquired post-separation, then it is also separate property. Lots of maybes here. Well, first off, we got to talk what is the date of separation. That's a whole nother episode all by itself with a very complex line of cases that discuss how do you define the date of separation. I'm not going to do that here and now, except let's just call it the date of separation, the day the marriage is determined to have ended. Anything after the date of separation is separate property. Anything before the date of marriage is separate property. Anything in the middle, community property, unless it was inherited or a gift. I'm going to get rid of that gift thing right now. So there's a very amusing and interesting case in California where husband did that thing that husbands do sometimes, or sometimes wives do it, bought their spouse a brand new car and put a bow on it and left it in the driveway and said, I love you forever, here's a gift, or words to that effect. And of course, a year later, their marriage ended. (laughs) And then, of course, the recipient spouse claims that that 
vehicle, the Porsche, was their separate property because it was a gift. And the court actually said, yeah, no, the definition of a gift in California has a lot to do with the station in life of the parties. So if they are billionaires, then yeah, maybe a Porsche is a reasonable gift. But if they're not very wealthy people, then no, we're not going to treat a gift of such a significant asset for people who may not have the proverbial pot that we're going to suddenly change an asset from community to separate based on being called a gift. So that's something you've got to keep in mind if you ever get a Porsche with a bow on it. Back to the stuff that's more significant. What happens, and we're going to get into this issue a little bit later, but what happens if you own something before marriage, but then you do something to it during marriage? That becomes an issue. Conversely, what happens if you own something during marriage, then you split up, and while you're split up, but before it's divided, it goes up or down in value. These are the hybridized items we're going to talk about. So what is what makes something community property other than the timeline I, I talked about already? The answer is this. When you are in an intact marriage between the date of marriage and the date of separation, everything you are is community. Your brain, your muscle, your sweat, your labor, your thoughts all belong to the community, to the marriage. So if you invent something, community property, if you create something, the Mona Lisa, community property. If you have great luck and you win the lottery, community property. Just ask Mrs. Rossi, another one of those ironic cases we'll talk about later. Lady won the lottery, but decided she wasn't going to disclose it to the court or to her soon-to-be ex-husband. Except he found out about it a year later and didn't go well for Miss Rossi at that point. So you're lucky, you work hard, you build a building, community property. Everything you are, all of your efforts, your hopes, your dreams, everything is community property. If you create an idea during the marriage, this becomes something of a matter of proof, by the way, you create an idea. And you write down your idea on a notepad and you leave it in your office and your spouse finds it. And then after separation, you develop that idea. That's going to be a hybridized asset. Why? Because part of it, the genesis of it, was community property. Now, it may well be that that genesis was absolutely valueless at that time, and it may be that it has no value, but it still has a community property component. Now, on the flip side, everything you do, think, own, work on, create your luck before marriage and after separation is similarly separate property, and your spouse has no claim upon it. That's the gist of it, okay? Unfortunately, <laughs> there are hundreds, if not thousands, of different hypothetical, not even hypothetical, real situations that I've encountered and any active family law has a, attorney has encountered because of the way these things go together in the time and the sequence and, and the valuations. The most common one is a house. So let's say wife owns a house before marriage equally be husband, doesn't matter. Wife owns a house before marriage. Then, after marriage, wife and husband refinance her house. Well, this creates an issue called, potentially, transmutation. That sounds something out of Frankenstein. But a transmutation is when somebody intentionally changes community property to separate property, or vice versa. That is called a transmutation. It changes the character. How did wife do this in our hypothetical house situation? Well, very often people will talk to a loan broker and say, I want to refinance my house. And they go to refinance the house, and the loan broker says, usually inaccurately, I'm sorry, um, your husband wife has bad credit. And so we need to take them off the loan, and therefore you have to take them off the house. Or we need your husband's credit, in this case, in order for you to qualify for the refinance wife, owner of the separate property. So we need to put him on title. The act of signing the deed 
from herself to herself and her husband changes that house from se her separate property to community property. Wow, that's not fair, you say? Well, it ac actually is if it's done right, and there's lots of protections built in, and I'm going to discuss some of them today. But there is still a protection for wife in that scenario. Family Code Section 2640 says that if there is a transmutation, then the value, the i.e. the equity, in the house at that date belongs to wife. So husband will share with wife in any increase in value going forward after the refinance when husband went on title, but he will have no claim on the interest that existed before he went on title. Now, can they avoid that result if they don't want it? Of course they can. Number one, you can have a prenup. Number two, you cannot listen to loan brokers whose self-interest tells them it'll be easier for me if you do it this way. You can contact a family law attorney and say, how do I protect myself? And still do that in an intact marriage. Second, you can go through it with an agreement and understanding of what we intend to do and what we intend to accomplish. You can create what's called a post-nuptial agreement. Now, there are lots of complexities to that, so don't try to do it on your own. But you can do that so you're explaining what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing it. And you can affect property interest during marriage with a properly done post-nuptial agreement. Another classic situation. Wife has a business before marriage. They get married, and wife's business continues to grow. And we can talk about two potentially different scenarios. It is so successful that wife is bringing home a salary of $300,000 a year when before she was only making $50,000 a year. It is so successful that the value of the business has gone from $1 million at the time of the marriage to $10 million when the marriage ends. My goodness, how do we value this business? Businesses and similar other assets are often handled by two different cases under California law called Pereira and Van Camp. And the analysis are pretty straightforward. In one hand, you may have an asset that is very, very capital intensive and, not, and is not affected as much by the efforts of a party. And in some cases, it's the reverse. It is totally hands-on, oftentimes a service business that is absolutely dominated by the individual themselves and their efforts. So wait a second. You told me, Dane, you said earlier that all of my efforts during marriage are community property, but you know what? There's another law over here, and it says that if you own separate property, then all of the, in the words of the law, all of the rents, issues, and profits of that separate property stay separate property. Oh my God, how do I reconcile these two thoughts? And here's how the courts have done it to fashion remedies. They apply these two cases and the concepts behind them to divide it in one way or the other. The first is they say, you know what? On this separate property that was so intense by the, by, the, by the wife's operation, we're going to give more value to the labors that she put in it during marriage because that's what made it grow. And remember, her labors during marriage are community property. So if we prove and the court finds that this business grew because of her efforts during marriage, then we're going to give the higher benefit or an allocation of value to the community property portion of the asset. Conversely, the court says, yeah, no, this business was really on autopilot. She really didn't have to do anything, and it grew just because of who it was. Wow, really? By way of illustration, she owned a company that made N95 masks, and COVID hit. You don't have to be a real good business person to sell a ton of masks in a pretty short period of time. That's an illustration. Conversely, backside of the marriage. Husband has a restaurant that he built up during marriage. And the marriage was, I mean, the marriage wasn't thriving, but the business was thriving. And the restaurant was just really doing well and it was growing and growing and growing. And you know what? They're getting ready to divide all the assets and the business, the restaurant is worth $3 million and COVID hits. And guess what? The business's value 
disappeared overnight. Wife says, well, no, I want you to use the $3 million value and not the $200,000 value for the fixtures that it's worth now. In that scenario, the court will look at whether or not, again, it was the efforts of the spouse post-separation that made it go up or down. If the court finds that he did it deliberately, you know what? She's going to win. If the court finds, however, that it was no fault of his own, that his restaurant was killed by COVID along with every other restaurant, we're not going to solely penalize him. Both members of the community result in its bad luck. So that's how we look at hybridized assets. We have to look at a way to give a value to the community portion and the separate portion. Another factor that's considered is, was there a fair compensation to the community for the efforts of the spouse in the business? So back to wife's business when she had it before marriage. She's working 80 hours a week, all kinds of great business. But remember what I said? She was bringing in $300,000 a year now in salary. Wow. So the question is, did the community get reasonably compensated for wife's efforts? Well, it certainly seemed that they did because they got $300,000 a year in income from those efforts that all went to the community. That's really, really important. Dividing assets. Well, uh, whether it's a business or otherwise, it is quite probable that there's going to be a forensic accountant involved. What's a forensic accountant? A forensic accountant is somebody that is hired typically by a party, sometimes appointed by the court. Why do you need a forensic accountant, you say? Answer, because no judge is going to want to have people putting in days and weeks and perhaps months of trial going through every check in the checkbook for 10 years to try to determine what's going on with this business. The forensic accountant is a reasonable way to present summaries of what's occurred together with individualized investigations and and assessments of transactions that lead to the ultimate conclusion of the controllable cash flow and the value. Some businesses, most businesses, are in fact hybridized. Well, which business, what's a kind of a business that would absolutely not be hybridized? Well, it's pretty straightforward. If you own real estate and you don't manage that real estate, you have employees that run it, Give you an example. You have a self-storage business, one of those storage locker places where everybody pays 500 bucks or a thousand bucks a month for a closet. Okay, it's a great business. And you don't run it. You you had people running it and every month they deposit money into your bank account. You don't got to do jack. Except file your taxes with all your income. And then you get married. Now, guess what? That business goes up in value because more people want storage. Real estate values go up, a variety of things. Was any of that reason for that going up because of the actions of the married spouse? And the short answer is no. Just like the restaurant that went out of business because of COVID, this business went up in value through no efforts during the marriage of the owner. As such, all of the rents, issues, and profits of the separate property asset, the storage locker business, is all retained by the, by the spouse and the, and the community has no claim on it whatsoever, even for quote unquote reasonable compensation because there was no work done on it by the spouse. As another example of a hybridized asset, there's a recent case in California that I can tell you people are on both sides of it's called Bonvino. And actually one of our attorneys was involved in litigating that case. Bonvino actually did something unique that hadn't been done before And that was hybridized real estate based upon the amount of money that went from one separate property house into perhaps another one. And the court indicated that was very different than the normal holdings historically that have said, we're going to use 2640 for this for the separate property interest. We're going to cut it off 2640. Remember, you get the money you put in, but you don't get anything else. You don't get interest on it. You don't get a pro rata increase in value. You don't get anything. That's it. Well, Bonvino said you can hybridize some real estate investments in some occasions that are part separate and part community. 
Another scenario is on a house is where this time let's give the house to husband. Husband has a house. They get married. They live in husband's house after marriage, but they don't refinance. They don't do anything to create what's called a transmutation we talked about. But what they do do is they pay the mortgage. Okay, what does that have to do with anything? Well, remember, you work at a job, you get a paycheck. What is that paycheck? That paycheck is community property. You then take that paycheck and you put it into your bank account, which is what? Community property. You then take that money in your bank and you pay your mortgage. You are using community property money to pay a, you remember, separate property mortgage. That was husband's debt on husband's house. And while you're paying that mortgage, what are you paying? Part of it goes to the principal. Part of it pays down the debt that is owed against that house. Therefore, you are using community property work, labor, money to increase the value of husband's separate property asset. There is a unique set of cases that deal with that scenario. We call that Moore Marsden. It's a relatively complex formula that I couldn't repeat right here, a cappella. Uh, but what we can do is describe it in context. What it does is, is it creates a sharing arrangement for the appreciation and the pay down of the principal balance so that the community and the separate property spouse will share in that the pay down and the growth. There are some complex issues of division of hybridized assets that are created by something simply called commingling. Commingling happens when you take typically it's cash, it's money. Typically, it doesn't have to be, but you may take, say you have a bank account when you get married and it has $100,000 in it, and then you get married and uh, you win the lottery. Well, as we already discussed, you know, Mrs. Rossi knows that's community property and you put it in the same bank account. So now we have $100,000 of separate property and now let's say you got $20,000 of community property and you put it into an account. Fast forward a year. Husband and wife decide, hey, let's go buy a vacation home. And they take that whole $120,000 and they put it into the property. Now, let me make it a better hypothetical. Well, first off, let's do the hundred twenty. We've now mixed the money, but assuming that's the only money that was in that account, it's pretty easy to find that money, isn't it? Yes, we took the whole 100 and the whole 20, put it into another asset. They're both still there. Now make it a little harder. Let's say you put in a $40,000 down payment on the vacation home and you got a loan. Well, first off, what's the character of the vacation home? Answer, it's probably community property. Why? Assuming husband and wife took title, husband and wife, joint tenants, community property, etc. Well, wait a second. What is the down payment? Can husband claim the entire $40,000 was his separate property because he had $100,000 of separate property. Can he then say, wait a second, that forty dollars is all mine? Well, he could say it. What's wife going to say? No, twenty of that is community property and only twenty of it's his. Well, I guess that sort of depends on how much money is left in the bank account now. If it's down to zero, guarantee your wife's going to say, my twenty is in that house. And husband is going to say, no, my twenty is in that house because the rest of the money has gone. These are issues of commingling and what we call tracing. Tracing is often involves forensic accountants as well, but it involves also documentation of bank statements, financial statements, transactions, transfers, a variety of things like that to help try to find out which money went where. And there are rules to help that. One of the rules is very helpful. It's called the Community Expense Doctrine. And the Community Expense Doctrine was created in marriage of C, S-E-E, you know, the candy people. Yes, they got divorced a long time ago. I think it was in the 60s. But in, in Marriage of C and the Community Expense Doctrine, they said, you know what, we're going to create a, a policy that says this. If there are two kinds of money in an account, we're going to presume that all of the community expenses are paid by community money. Wow, how does that help us? Husband in an earlier case says it's 100 of mine is separate, 20 is community. What happens now when $20,000 is spent? And it's not spent on an asset, it's spent on vacations, it's spent on um, the kids' needs, education, toys, cars, boats, whatever. Okay? 
Well, the cars and boats probably weren't the best example, but you get the idea. In that scenario, marriage of C, the community expense doctrine, will say, we're going to presume that all that 20000 that was gone was used to pay for all of the community living expenses. So now the only money left is the separate property money. So that's there are tools like that to help us divide assets. The last thing I'm going to talk about is complex issues like restricted stock units or stock options. There is a whole dedicated law that relates to the division of these kinds of assets. Simply put, they prorate the value. Often it's pro tanto based upon how much time. What does that mean? That means if I get a stock option in 2016 and it vests in 2019 and we divorce after the stock option vests in 2019, then guess what? That stock is entirely community property. What happens, however, if the same facts, I got the stock option or RS restricted stock unit, RSU, we got it in 2016, we separated in 2018, and the stock vested in 2019. There are different theories of law, but the gist of it is the stock will probably be, absent some other circumstances, two-thirds community and one-third separate. Why? Because the last third vested outside of the end of the marriage. And so there's lots of methodologies that are now being employed by the court to hybridize more and more assets. And so it's no longer bright lines about dividing stuff. Everything that I talked about today typically applies the same for debts. There are some other rules that talk about the lender's intent, which is was a lender looking at a community property uh, asset for security, or are we looking at the credit worthiness of a spouse? Those sometimes can become important, and sometimes they're merely tangential issues. <clears throat> there are a variety of other issues that affect all of these decisions or can spin it a certain way, but that's the gist of it. And so, that said, I'm going to conclude this episode. Thank you so much for investing your time, and I hope you found this information helpful. If you'd like more information, you can download the ebook Divorce 101 for free on our website, divorceauthority.com. You can also follow me on social media at Divorce Authority. I'm Dane Holstrom, and when I do becomes I don't, turn to Divorce Authority. See you next time.